The Last Guardian is out at last. After the release of Ico in 2001 and Shadow of the Colossus in 2005, it's fair to say Team Ico's third game has had the most troubled development of them all. It began as a PS3 title in 2007, but there's no telling that we'd be waiting 9 years to see anything come to fruition, nor that we'd see it release on Sony's next console, the PS4. The results are still breathtaking. Despite its age, The Last Guardian features some truly beautiful backdrops thanks to excellent art direction from director Fumito Ueda. But the story behind its technology, from a leaked target render in 2009 to its eventual release in 2016, plays a big part in explaining how the final game turned out. It's Tom from Digital Foundry, and today I'll be taking a look at the history and evolution of The Last Guardian. So the first question is, where did it all start? Well, development was first announced in 2007, actually as one of two new projects. Team Ico, as the team was then known, was hot off the heels of the critically acclaimed Shadow of the Colossus. It had created a grand swan song for the aging PS2 hardware, one of its most technically demanding and brilliant titles. As a result, interest was high for its follow-up on the newly minted PS3, but our first actual sighting of The Last Guardian came in 2008, through a public job advert for the company. One image was released next to it, the mysterious motif of a chain leading into the ground. Next we had this in mid-2009, actual video. This is a rare leaked trailer from PlayStationLifestyle.net, showing the target render used by the developer, likely from earlier in development. It was an internal demo with a working title of Project Trico, a blueprint much like Killzone 2's infamous first reveal that Team Ica would strive to recreate using actual PS3 hardware. It showed the basic visual concept behind an eventual PS3 title, an almost CG-like presentation at points, though with some very obvious limitations. Character shadows were missing for one, and aliasing was prevalent. It even had environments like this entrance that would be completely cut from later trailers. Even so, you could see the same rendering techniques used on Shadow of the Colossus translating directly to this new engine. Particularly, the ruined Aztec-style architecture, the faux HDR lighting, motion blur, depth of field, and physics-based elements on chains and even body ragdolls. It was all there and very familiar. The industry has moved on to far more refined techniques since, but many of these were cutting edge for the time, and the transition was being made from PS2 to Team Ico's PS3 engine. But only a few months later we got something much better. At Sony's E3 2009 conference, the game got its first official trailer, now renamed to The Last Guardian. Surprisingly, this was almost shot for shot identical to that target render, meaning you could compare the two directly to spot big changes. For example, rendering of grass shifted from a fuller geometric design to less taxing alpha transparencies for each tuft. Lighting was improved overall, though the motion blow was downgraded to use fewer samples, creating a banding effect as the boy runs through the tunnel. The biggest changes by far were in environment and character designs. The Aztec-style architecture of the target render was no more, and the E3 trailer moved to more ornate, mossy temples with a grey colour palette. In the end, this aesthetic is very close to what we got in the final product. The boy's model was also replaced, going from a basic design clearly meant as a placeholder, to a more detailed model with a higher polygon count. As for Trico, feather rendering took a big step up too, with less popping across his body as the camera pans passed. But again, this early trailer set in stone the visual style that would stick for years to come. In retrospect, director Fumito Ueda confirmed that this 2009 showing was actually running on genuine PS3 hardware. However, he states that because performance was so poor at this point in time, footage was specced up for the occasion. Simply put, the build was rendered at half the frame rate before doubling playback speed to disguise PS3's poor performance. In motion, it looked buttery smooth, a clear 30 FPS, and did a great job of hiding the game's troubled development. It's also fair to assume this was targeting 720p on PS3 at best, the most common target resolution of the generation, and a far cry from the 1890p we'd eventually get on the PS4 Pro. From the outside view, release seemed imminent at this point. A new trailer emerged from the Tokyo Game Show, two separate videos in both 2009 and 2010. 
there was real optimism around 2010 that The Last Guardian would be released after so much waiting. So confident, in fact, that a launch date was penned in for 2011. In truth, that TGS trailer would be among the last footage we'd see of The Last Guardian for six years. It was around this time that development struggles were aired out in public, with word that other studios, such as Sony Santa Monica, were pitching in with optimization work on PS3. Trailer stopped being released, with only rare mentions from Sony that the project was still alive. In early 2012, a long generation was coming to a close. The PS3's time was coming to an end, and Sony's new console, the PS4, was shaping up for a reveal the following year. It was at this point the team moved its engine to the new hardware, according to Sony's Shuhei Yoshida. With the game so tightly customised to the PS3 cell processor though, this was not an easy process, taking a year to get it running with a radically different AMD architecture. To make matters even trickier, Team Ico had also disbanded, with key team members such as Fumito Ueda going on to form a new studio, Gen Design. The original talent behind The Last Guardian worked by contract on the project, but it was very much in the hands of Sony Interactive Entertainment Japan and help from its global studios to finish the work it had started. At last, the game was finally reintroduced with a lengthy slice of gameplay at Sony's E3 2015 conference. Officially confirmed as a PS4 title, it ran at a crisp native 1080p, showing off a collapsing bridge sequence that showed how the game played. This was a big statement of intent from Sony. The frame rate is, in reality, more representative here of what we'd eventually get on PS4 Pro at 1080p, a fairly solid 30fps despite lots of physics-based action, where the standard PS4 would struggle. Comparing the visuals between this 2015 demo and the final release in 2016, it's very similar, though with a few interesting changes. Matching gameplay as best we can, the colour tone is lighter on the year older build. Also, geometry is shifted around very slightly, trees are added into the final build too, decorating parts of the scene, but overall it's a fair reflection of what we'd end up getting. In fact, what we have now is perhaps even better in pure technical terms. See in this shot, ambient occlusion is stronger in the final release, where it was hard to catch under the log on the 2015 demo. Shading between objects and characters was certainly factored in back then, but it's more prominent in the final build. All of which brings us to the final game we have today. The visual style is captivating. Without a doubt, it's the true successor to Ico and Shadow of the Colossus we've been waiting for, a release made all the sweeter knowing it may never have happened. It is hard to shake the sense though that the core technology has a through line stemming all the way back to that E3 2009 showing. It has improved massively, but for better or worse, playing The Last Guardian can be like opening a time capsule from 2009 an age where 3D camera and character controls were still being refined by the team. The good news is Team Ico excelled, even back then, in several areas that helped The Last Guardian hold up on PS4 today. Animations are a genuine high point. On Trico, his ears flap individually, he reels back when he's nervous and rolls around in water when he's playful, all details that bring this creature to life. Also building on the work started with Shadow of the Colossus is rendering of fur. Trico's covered in a dense plume of feathers this time, which has several new dynamics. One neat touch is the way small pockets of feathers below in isolation, fluttering individually as if caught by the wind, much like hair on a cat or dog. Individual parts of Trico can get soaked in water too, adding a reflective shader to only that part of his body, like the tail here. In this way, each part of this creature is built around individual parts, all adhering to their own logic. The tail can be dragged around manually for example, which plays a part in puzzles, and the front of his body rig is designed to rotate independently of the rear. The developers in-house physics really come into play with this, and body ragdoll and cloth simulation are in full force as the boy scales around this creature's body. In many ways, it's an enhanced take on the dynamics used in Shadow of the Colossus. Parts of the final game are stuck in time though. Geometry and textures are good examples. Again, they're often simple but effective, with basic polygonal designs for each dungeon you come up against. It's a technical limit of the PS3 era that's factored into the game's visual style, though the sharp angles on the architecture still work for creating these labyrinthine environments. 
there's also a convincing sense of scale to the world, where stepping outside reveals a maze of pillars, walls and towers leading far into the distance. Seeing details up close, especially the low quality textures, is a game that has clear roots in the PS3 era, but at a distance it still holds up well. Many of these limits are at least hidden by the game's excellent lighting. Volumetric lighting and bloom give the game a distinctively saturated look, a trademark of the developer's games. High dynamic range support on PS4, which activates automatically if you have a compatible TV, also takes advantage of the inherently wide contrast between light and dark in most scenes. As a final image, colours are very much muted, but lighting appears natural and easy on the eye. There are nice embellishments on top of that too, like the baked in subsurface scattering effect. See how the boy's ears turn a light pink when the sun's positioned behind him, but turning back it returns to its normal colour. Screen space reflections are used across bodies of water too. The ordering that elements are reflected, like grass and geometry, can sometimes appear muddled, but it does factor in all movements from Trico, the boy and rubble nearby. Unfortunately, not all visual elements hold up so well here. While yes, you do have ambient occlusion around grass, most foliage in the game suffers from an obvious stippling effect. It's a kind of dither that makes grassy areas flicker as you pan the camera, something the game's anti-aliasing seems to struggle to address. On the other hand, The Last Guardian has plenty of post-process effects that bolster the end result in motion. Motion blur is pristine and has a filmic quality, with none of the banding artifacts we saw in that 2009 demo. A frame blending technique is also used, similar to Shadow of the Colossus and Ico, blurring the image slightly, though nowhere near as aggressively. This appears more prominently on the PS4 Pro version in the 4K mode, giving it a hazier look than we might expect from an 1890p image. Camera changes during cutscenes show a kind of crossfade as a result, but curiously we don't get this on the standard PS4 or even PS4 Pro in the 1080p mode. Overall, the technical showing from The Last Guardian is mixed, but still shines brightly thanks to the timeless quality of its visual direction. Clearly both textures and world design show the project's age, but the rendering techniques over the top help it hold up in the current day. After all the delays, the many different iterations and builds shown at trade events and the move to new hardware, it's a surprise we've ended up with the finished product. The path to release has been long, but for fans of Ico and Shadow of the Colossus, it's certainly been worth the wait. That's about all I have for you today though. If you enjoyed this look back over The Last Guardian's development, please do like and subscribe to support our work. Also, there's a way for you to enjoy this video exactly as we intended before uploading to YouTube by visiting our Patreon page at digitalfoundry.net. Feel free to check that out, but until next time, thanks for watching.